entitled Abraham's Shoes. And let me explain the rationale for this series. Because even if it doesn't seem like it, there is always a why or two behind the what that we do as a church, or in this case, what we talk about on Sunday morning as a church. Uh, For starters, let me ask you this. Who's your role model? As a person, who's your role model? Now, there are several, perhaps many, possible responses to that question. I suspect that for some people in the room, they might be willing to admit that they don't have one. That they are kind of making it up as they go, or, differently, they think enough of their own opinion, they don't need anybody else's. And yeah, I don't know if you know it or not, there are people like that in the world. There are people who may not know that they need one. There are people who may not think that there is a good one to be had. Okay? Here's the scarier part. I don't think that you can understand, even at a basic level, what disciplines like psychology or sociology teach us about human beings without recognizing that all of us have role models. And the most frightening part of that is you may not even be aware of who your role models are. Who are the people that are setting the agenda for your life? Who are the ones who are telling you whether or not you're successful, whether or not you're a failure, whether or not your life has purpose or meaning? Who are those people? Because they're there, even if you don't think so. It could be the ghosts of your past. It could be your father, long since dead, whispering in your ear that you are a failure and you will never amount to anything. It defines your life. Ask anyone who has that ghost in their ear and they will tell you that. It defines their life. It could be a friend of yours or a coworker of yours who just seems to have an easier life or seems to have more disposable income and therefore is able to do more fun things or have more fun toys, and that person is your measuring stick (laughs) for your life. Happens all the time. As Americans, our culture very often ends up being our role model or our measuring stick. You think your life needs to look like the people you see on TV. And so do I. You think that truth is spoken to you by the people on TV. And so do I, if I'm not careful. These are the role models of our life. Now see, if you're a Christian, you may think to yourself, well, my role model is Jesus. And congratulations, I'm entirely sure that the right answer to every question in church is Jesus. Of course he is. You're right. Jesus is is our role model. He is always held up to be that. Would you say with me that one of the problems with Jesus, can we say this, that there is a problem with Jesus? One of the problems with Jesus is you're not Jesus, and neither am I. And I love Jesus, and I love what Jesus teaches, and what Jesus has taught has changed my life, but I am not Jesus. And so sometimes when I look at Jesus or I listen to Jesus, all I feel is the gap between us. And I wish I could do what he said, but I don't. I could use a more human role model, if you will. One a little more like me. Do you know the Bible has an answer to that? Your Bible actually has an answer to that wish that I have. If you were to ask your Bible, Bible, tell me, who should I pattern my life after? Who should be my example that I should follow? 
in whose footsteps should I follow? Do you know that after Jesus, there is one figure in your Bible who is time and time again held up to be the person after which people should pattern their life? And that person is Abraham. He is mentioned by every major author in the Jesus portion of your Bible called the New Testament, written at least 1,500 years after his life, more likely 2,000 years after his life. And they all look back at this figure who lives somewhere 2200 B.C., 2000 B.C., and they say about him, this is who you, Christian people, need to be like. Be like Abraham. So it seems to me, based simply on that observation, that you and I as Christian people would be very wise to pay attention and spend time talking about this extraordinary figure in the Old Testament called Abraham. And that's what we start today. If you're reading in your Old Testament, in the first book of your Old Testament, this is where you first encounter the man we know as Abraham. At the time, he is called Abram. Just for the sake of clarity, I'm always going to call him Abraham. You encounter him at the end of Genesis chapter 11. And this is, these seem to be two of those kinds of paragraphs that if you're trying to read through your Bible, you really read through fast or you just skip them over. Because it's got all those names in them and all those, you know, how long people lived in them and who begat whom in it, and you think, this is not for me. Well, if you pay attention, I'd like to suggest to you that this opening paragraph or two about Abraham actually tells us a lot about him. And as we begin our series today, we want to start at the beginning of his story, and this is that. Notice, please, we are told in Genesis 11, 26 and following this about Abraham. Number one, he had a baby brother. That baby brother's name was Haran, or if you want to try to pronounce Hebrew, Haran. Uh -huh. Bless you. Haran. Guess what happened to that baby brother? That baby brother died. That baby brother died before his dad died. That baby brother left his children, most notably someone named Lot, who you will encounter as you read through Abraham's story, to the care of the larger family unit. Ever known any family that has had a sibling die at an early or young age? I have. I know several. Are you aware of how that marks a family for the rest of their life? I bet you are. This is Abraham. He lost a baby brother. That was probably very special to him. And he ended up having to be part of the caretaking team of his larger family for those children that Haran left. Here's what else we know about Abraham, just from these opening sentences about him. He had a wife here called Sarai. She will later be called Sarah. And that's what I'll call her, just for the sake of clarity. And what we know about Abraham's wife, among other things, is that she was barren. That means she couldn't have kids. Have you ever known a family, a woman specifically, who has wanted desperately to have children and can't? I know people like that. Do you know what that kind of pain is like? You ever heard anybody talk about it? I'll bet you that's what Sarah was like. And because Sarah was like that, I bet that's what Abraham felt. What you have to understand, and this is something where our culture is different than this culture, there is almost no worse social stigma in the culture of Abraham than for a family to not have children and for a woman to be barren. Almost nothing. So think of the worst social stigmas in our day. I don't know what they might be. Uh, used to be 20 years ago, if you filed for bankruptcy or you had a foreclosure and your friends learned about it, this was a terrible black eye. Well, because of the economy now, it's not so much now, right? 
How about you have a husband or a wife or an older son who everybody knows is the town or neighborhood drunk? And if there's a car that is strangely not parked on the street but up on the sidewalk and has run over somebody's mailbox, it's going to be your son or husband who did it. Okay, you know what that stigma feels like? Can you imagine that? Okay, that's what Abraham and Sarah felt like every day. I can almost guarantee you that for Abraham's... Oops. <laughs> nice. In Abraham's family... Thank you. Uh, in Abraham's family, I can almost guarantee you that the least favorite son of Terah, or Terah, Abraham's dad, was Abraham. Know why? Because he didn't have any kids. That's how deeply it goes. This is Abraham, the man after whom we are told to pattern our life. Then we find out, uh uh-oh, can you guys advance the slide for me? Uh Uh-oh, okay, well, we'll just continue. Notice in that last paragraph, uh, the second paragraph, we find out that sometime during his dad's life, he was told to uproot his family from a place called Ur, which is down by Kuwait, modern-day Kuwait, or southern Iraq. And they were going to move to a place called Canaan, which is where modern Israel is. But they decided to stop halfway. So here they are. Abraham is older, and his dad comes along, and things kind of seem settled for their family, and everything's great for their family, and... After Abraham's got everything set up, his dad says, time out. We're going to blow everything up and we're going to move. Appreciate, okay, the move from Ur to Canaan is only by road about 300 miles. But in that day and time, it would have been like a world away. My wife can tell you the story of people in her lineage in Texas who lived in Dallas and made the decision in the late 1800s to move to Corsicana, Texas, which by car on I-45 is only about half an hour. But when they left in the late 1800s, they felt like they were never going to see their family again because it was just so far. Okay, well, that was what Abraham and his dad and the rest of their family was signing up to do to leave their established home, leave their people, leave their country, and to go someplace else. And they never made it. They only made it halfway. And then there, in that new land, after their dad said, follow me on this half-brained idea to go to a new place, we are told the last verse of Genesis 11 that Terah, Abraham's dad, died. So fantastic. Dad, you got this great idea. We're going to move to this new place 300 miles away. Seems like the other side of the planet to us. Awesome. We're with you. We're going to do it. And you die halfway through the move. Fantastic. Abraham is on his own. Now we pause here because I want you to realize that in spelling all that out, Abraham sure does sound a lot like us. He sounds a lot like your life. He sounds a whole lot like my life. There is nothing overly heroic or overly legendary about that account that you find in Genesis chapter 11 toward the end of the chapter, right? By the way, notice one more thing. Um, If you can remember those verses that were up on the screen, if you pan through those two paragraphs at the end of Genesis 11, there is a glaring obvious omission or absence. Know what it is? God. God is not mentioned. Abraham wasn't a believer in God for all those seven decades and change. That he was living with his dad, taking care of his brother's kids, having a barren wife, bearing that stigma, and on down the line. It's very likely that Abraham and his family would have been uh, people who observed the native religion or local religion of the Babylonian culture of the time down around Ur. 
And this would be where you believe in all kinds of gods, and they're not particularly nice gods. In fact, there is some evidence that around the time of Abraham, one of the things that was a signature of the religion in the land that Abraham left is child sacrifice. Yeah. Yeah. This is who Abraham was. Abraham was a pagan. He was not a Christian. He would not have gone to church at River Tree this morning. Okay? He's just like us. He may just be like you. You may, even if you wouldn't say it out loud to anybody, I understand that. There are probably things in your life that you think God can't overcome or that you somehow think marginalizes you or your family. And if God's going to care about somebody, it certainly isn't going to be you. It's going to be those nicer people who have better looking lives, etc. And I'm here to tell you, if nobody else in the Bible convinces you that's wrong, Abraham should. Because Abraham's you. Abraham is not a spectacular figure. He does not have stellar character. Abraham's a pagan. You get it? This is for everybody. Ah, now. We get all this biographical data about Abraham, and then we hear these verses. Right out of the blue. Abraham the pagan is living in Haran, and... Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. The Lord God said to Abram, God showed up. Later in this series, we're going to talk about in more detail the promise that is made here to Abraham. Do notice in brief, what God asks is that Abraham picks up his family, leaves the family of his that don't want to come, like his dad's family, and completes the journey to Canaan, which will be given to him. And then please notice in the second paragraph on the screen, that's precisely what Abraham does. A God that he has never known before in his life, a God that he has never heard from before in his life, shows up the first time and somehow gets his attention and his instinct or at least his eventual conclusion is, I'll do this. I'm going to obey. There's a passage in your New Testament in the letter of Hebrews, chapter 11, that has been titled by some, The Hall of Fame of Faith. Because the entire chapter is about people in the Old Testament that we as Christians should pattern our life after. Because these are people of faith. And lo and behold, the person in this chapter who gets the most space is, no surprise to you now, the person of Abraham. And we're actually going to talk about how Abraham is discussed in this chapter even more than in Genesis. This is how the writer of Hebrews, some 2,000 years after the life of Abraham, starts to talk about why Abraham is a role model. The writer of Hebrews says, chapter 11, verse 8, By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive from God as an inheritance. And he set out not knowing where he was going. What pattern do you see here? that can be replicated by us. Why do you think that the biblical writers said it was this man's life that was the superlative example for all people who would follow Jesus? Well, first, you observe at the start of this story of the magisterial Abraham that no matter how far he was from God, God showed up. God surprised him. And he was at least open to that surprise. Here's one of the things that I have observed in talking to all kinds of people, all different kinds of walks of life, 
in my 20 years as a pastor. There comes a point for both Christians and non-Christians where they give up on hearing from God. And different circumstances or different reasons will, will lie behind that decision. But a good number of people get to the point where they give up. And even if they continue to go to church the rest of their life, they will do it going through their motions, believing that maybe God has an active relationship with some people, maybe God has a close interpersonal relationship with some people, but it's not going to be them. They're Abraham in their own way, shape, or form. They're Abraham. They don't think God is out there. They don't think God cares. Whatever. And here's the comfort from the story of Abraham. God doesn't care that you think that. God is bigger than your biggest doubt. God is bigger than your biggest indifference. Bigger. God didn't ask for Abraham's permission to show up in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. He just did it. And then Abraham had to decide what to do about that. You see that? And the great thing is, here's what I can tell you about God as he's presented in the pages of the Bible. He wants to show up like he did for Abraham in every person's life. Now, it's not always big. It's not always brash. It's not always like it was for Abraham. But he wants to be there. He wants to be heard. And he wants you to obey. And you are not big enough to stop him from doing that. You see that? One of the people that have marked my own spiritual life and the way that I conduct myself as a Christian day in and day out is the person in church history who founded a group that you may know of called the Jesuits, a man named St. Ignatius of Loyola. One of the things that he taught his followers, those people who would spread the Christian faith all over the world, especially to hostile places, is he said, every time there's a surprise in your life, you need to stop and listen because that's probably God talking. Oh, that sounds like Abraham, doesn't it? Every time something surprises you or faith seems to take you on a 90 degree turn or a 180 degree turn or whatever 90 plus 180 is, 270 I think, if it takes you on a 270 degree turn, you need to pause, you need to watch because surprise is God's language, St. Ignatius said. Allow God to surprise you. And stop thinking that your doubts or disbeliefs or brokenness are too big for God not to show up. He's going to surprise you. But then notice what God did, namely what God said when God showed up. God showed up for the first time in this 70-year-old man's life and said to him, I want you to do something that is unusual, it is unknown, and it is absolutely unsafe. God shows up to Abraham and says, Hello, my name is God. You and I have not met. How are you doing? Great. Here's what I'd like to tell you. I'd like you to pick your life up which you've already done once, by the way, moving from Ur to Haran, I'd like you to not leave it there. I'd like you to pick your life up, leave whatever part of your family doesn't want to come with you behind, and I'd like you to move to a land that you've never seen before. A land full of strange people speaking a strange language who have a different religion and a different culture and a different economic system that you've never seen before. I don't know, like Arkansas. I couldn't pick on Texas, which I would have, because I've already mentioned Texas before in the message. Moving on. So, Abraham hears God say this to him. How could Abraham not hear that instruction and think, number one, that's unusual. 
the gods that I'm used to don't ask such strange things out of people. Number two, you're asking me to do the unknown, to go to some place that I cannot see, that I do not know, do not know, full of people that are strangers to me. This seems unknown, completely open-ended. And number three, this is unbelievably unsafe. This is crazy, frankly. You want me to uproot my family to go to a place full of people that I don't know, where my family, very likely in this culture, there are not police cruisers cruising the neighborhood, who could get robbed or killed or who knows what. Who wouldn't think if you were in Abraham's shoes, gosh, I don't even know how I'm going to feed my family if I do this, right? And Abraham does it anyway. There's a pretty famous Christian author and radio teacher by the name of Chip Ingram. And he writes in a book of his, Good to Great, uh, Good to Great God, this, about this episode, in fact. See if it does not ring true to the example we see in Abraham's life. Chip Ingram writes, I want to suggest that every Christian life is marked by windows of opportunity that demand a radical step of faith in order to follow Christ and fulfill his purposes for them. The difference between good and great is not a matter of knowledge or pedigree, but a willingness to take a radical step of faith. What makes a step of faith radical is that it will always involve significant risk. In nearly every aspect of your relationship with God, the Lord will bring you to the edge of a decision at which point you'll have to decide whether to leap in the direction he's calling you or pull back to a place that seems safe. Here's how it works. At a critical point in each aspect of life, you will have to make a decision to make that pits obedience against your comfort and convenience. And while you usually know which direction God wants you to go or to choose, you also know most people will think you are absolutely insane for obeying what God's asking you to do. As it reads in Hebrews 11.6, without faith is impossible to please God. So, where there is no risk, there is no faith. And where there is no faith, there is no pleasing God. Nor is there any joy or intimacy with him. Sounds like Abraham, does it not? So if Abraham really is the pattern of our life, the person after which we should model our own lives day in and day out, then it seems to me that you and I need to expect that God is going to surprise us. I don't know how often, probably more regularly than we think. And when he surprises you, it seems like what we can anticipate he's going to ask is stuff that seems unsafe, unknown, and unusual. And it will involve risk. You may have to have a conversation with somebody you don't want to have. You may, you may have to reach out to somebody who seems uncomfortable to you. You may, you may need to make a vocational decision that you don't want to make. You may have to end a relationship, and you know it's going to hurt. You may need to move, change gears, change directions in midlife. These are scary things. And yet this apparently is how the God of the Bible works, at least according to the story of Abraham. You see it? By the way, can I add, before we move on, all of us who call River Tree home, and go back more than two years, you did this. Do you see that? You know who you were two years ago when you made the very brave decision to change direction as a church, change locations as a church, change what we're trying to do as a church? You were Abraham. And you did what other people thought was crazy, unusual, unknown, unsafe. You were Abraham. And I applaud you for it. I think you can see that stuff pretty plainly, right? I do, however, want to maybe 
pause a little longer on something that if you're in church or you're a Christian person, frankly, we can take it for granted in a way that is not helpful for unchurched people. So let's not this morning. We are told in Genesis uh, chapter 12, verse 1, and also in that verse from Hebrews where we are told the high points of Abraham's story, that God spoke to Abraham. Again, let me remind you, this is a man in his mid-70s with all the baggage that I described, and he had never in his life worshipped God, heard from God, anything. And then in his mid-70s, God shows up and speaks to him. Church people, Christian people, this is what you need to understand. Okay? You may be used to looking at phrases or words like that in the Bible and thinking, sure, I buy that. Even if I don't quite know what it is or don't quite know how to experience it, I buy that. Everybody else does it. And they think, why on earth does God only speak to crazy people? My wife will tell you I have a love-hate relationship with Bill Maher on HBO. I watch him faithfully um, because it's important to watch the people who disagree with you. And one of the things that Bill Maher, who is an atheist, uh, is very vehement about, and he is not alone. There are a lot of contemporary atheists who would say the same thing. They say that religion is a disease. It is a neurological disease. They would be people who say this. That medically, physiologically, if you take all the, if you get the Bible out of the way and all those beliefs that we stack up on our lives and we just analyze it from the outside, they would say, how can you not come to the conclusion that if somebody told you God was speaking to them, you should immediately have the people in the white coats and the white van come by and pick them up, put them in a straitjacket, and send them to an asylum. Right? God spoke to Abraham. Let me tell you something about Abraham. You can, you're going to get the chance, if you want, to read through his entire biography in Genesis. Here are some of the ways in the total of Abraham's life that God speaks to him. And you don't know it yet because we're early in his story. A few chapters later, in Genesis chapter 15, it's the first time you see it, Abraham feels like God speaks to him in a vision or a dream. That's one way in Abraham's life he would say he knew God was speaking to him. Several times in his life, he feels like God is speaking to him through somebody else. You'll encounter in the life of Abraham somebody named Melchizedek. You'll also encounter people who talk to him about his brother's son, so his nephew named Lot in Genesis 18. So Abraham would feel like on occasion other people were speaking to him and it was, God, it was as if God himself were speaking through those people. But honestly, most of the time, Abraham doesn't explain it. He doesn't explain what he means when he says simply, God spoke to me. So let's at least open the question of how are you going to know if God's talking to you? If it's true that the way that our Christian life is going to work is that God is going to surprise us in ways that we cannot fathom and cannot predict, and he will ask of us things that are extraordinary and remarkable, but also very risky. How are we going to know when it happens? How? Here are some of the ways that your Bible tells you you know that God's speaking. Ready? Your conscience will tell you. We are told in the pages of the New Testament, specifically by Paul, over and over again, that one of the things God does in the person of his spirit for a Christian person is he lives within the deepest parts of us, in the marrow of our soul, and he is our moral conscience. When you have a nagging, uh, a, a nagging idea that sticks with you, that you can't avoid, and you can't put it away, Maybe it's a relationship that you need to fix or someone you need to forgive. 
or some new bold venture to do something for somebody that seems really outlandish, but boy, you cannot get rid of that idea. You need to listen to that nagging idea. You need to listen to the voice of God inside of you. Because if you can't get rid of it, that is a sure sign that God is being incessant. And he does not want you to avoid doing what he's saying. We are told in the New Testament over and over that one of the great powers of the people that are gathered here this morning who are a part of Jesus' church is that we speak for God to one another. I wish, quite frankly, that more Christian people would realize that in the life of the other Christian people around them, they have the potential to be the voice of God himself. And frankly, most Christian people do not speak to each other in that way. But you can. I bet you've had a moment in your life where somebody told you exactly what you needed to hear at exactly the right time. You need to stop and listen. That's God speaking to you. God speaks through His Word. When we encounter Scripture, it takes life. I'm always amazed when people talk to me about the messages that that I preach on Sunday morning. Well, frankly, I'm amazed that anybody talks to me about them after I preach them. But after I get over that fact, I'm always amazed at how God tells them to use what I talk about. Because I think, you know, that's not really what I intended. But it's precisely what God intended for you to hear and take to heart. This is why we're very intentional about you interacting with Scripture, because we know it's one of the surest places that God will speak to you. We know it. And on down the line. My point to you is simply this. God does want to speak, and He does want to speak in the same way that He spoke to Abraham. And He will, if you let Him, speak to you in the same way. And when He speaks to you, He is going to ask you to be brave and to be courageous and to do surprising things. In short, He is going to ask you to have faith in Him and what He's asking you to do. One of the great writers in church history about faith and how faith in God stands at the center of everything that Christianity is is someone from Denmark in the 1800s named Soren Kierkegaard. A little bit of trivia. If my son was not named Eli, he was going to be named Soren for this person. Um, which if I have another kid, knock on wood, we won't. I maybe will name him or her Soren. Here are some things that Soren Kierkegaard says about the centrality of the kind of faith that Abraham has in the life of every Christian. See if what he says doesn't ring true about what you heard this morning in Genesis 11 and 12. Soren Kierkegaard says, as a Christian person, you need to understand that faith is always the completion of understanding. Understanding is never the completion of faith. Want that uh, a little more simply said? If you're waiting for God to explain everything to you, if you're waiting to comprehend what he asks you to do fully before you do it, it's never coming. Never coming. You have got to act in faith before you understand completely. Kierkegaard elsewhere writes this, you as a Christian person must venture out in life. This is a great analogy. You must venture out in life, out onto the sea, and not stand on the shore along with all the other watching or disinterested bathers. Anything truly worthwhile requires risk, followed by a reward you cannot see at first. That's Abraham. And that's what God calls us to be, too. And then last, Kierkegaard writes, Faith is a restless thing. It drives those who believe so that we cannot settle for what we have in this world. Faith is stronger than a burning fever. I bet that's exactly how Abraham felt when God showed up in Genesis chapter 12. Let me give you a moment at the end of our message today 
for you to give God the space to talk to you about one or several of those summary points on the screen behind me. These are ways that you can interact with God himself about what we talked about today and what you saw in Abraham. So would you take a minute and be open to God talking to you about those things, and then I'll pray for us all.